Following the 2003 season, the New England Patriots celebrated their second world championship in three years at a Super Bowl ring ceremony hosted by Patriots owner Robert Kraft. This magnificent world championship ring weighs 107.3 grams, making it the largest Super Bowl ring ever made, totaling just over five carats of diamonds. Those diamonds had special meaning to veteran receiver Troy Brown and veteran linebacker Teddy Bruschi. We've been around the longest now, Troy and I. You know, we, we are the longest tenured Patriots on the team now, and uh, I like to think that I've, I've helped form the Patriot way. It's who I am. It's, it's how we conduct ourselves, and uh, uh, I don't want to experience any other team's way. <laughs> to get two or three years like this, uh, I mean, it motivates us to, to get, the, get the pinky field. Get another one. <laughs> As night fell on New England, one question remained. Could the Patriots win a third Super Bowl? Could they become a dynasty? Football history was calling, and history is head coach Bill Belichick's favorite subject, thanks in part to his father, Steve Belichick, a longtime college scout and one-time professional fullback. The history of his dad, he was the equipment guy with the Detroit Lions or whatever, and asked him to come out and play for the team, and he ended up probably being one of their better players. Steve Belichick, number 30, scored three touchdowns in 1941, his first and only NFL season. Six decades later, he watched son Bill enter his 30th NFL season. He really made it a point to try to stay out of the way. You know, he knew what everybody was trying to do, the, the work that we were all trying to do on the sideline. And, you know, he's taking a couple big hits. Uh, Otis Smith ran over him at the end of the 96 season. Despite the inherent dangers, Steve was on the sideline for the Patriots' first two championships. Getting knocked down was exactly what the 2004 Patriots needed. Everybody in this entire region was telling the players how great we are. And everything was just great, great, greater. And really, the only person was me telling the team that we've got to work on this, we got to work on that, this won't be good enough, that won't be good enough. And, and don't worry about what everybody else is saying because it really, it won't be good enough. <laughs> A lesson learned in a preseason game against the Bengals. At the end of the first quarter, I think they'd already scored three times, they like 21 points. So I took the starters out and put the whole second team in for the second quarter. You pulled the first defense out after their second touchdown. Was that a message to be sent to them? Well, they weren't getting much done. We were all sort of mad about that. We, were, we, we uh, it, sort of, it sort of pissed us off a little bit. What Bill does is later in the second half, he puts us back in. I told them at halftime, you're playing the second half and into the fourth quarter. And if you're going to play like this, then, you know, we, we need a lot of work. And they beat the crap out of us again, you know, and uh, I think it was a big wake-up call that we weren't as good as we thought we were. The next week in practice, no player wanted to see Coach Belichick headed their way. When you get the head coach coming up to you and asking you a question, it's can you think on your feet? What's going to happen if the offense jumps offside? Sorry. Safety. Safety? Vince jumped, did not win. Okay. What's going to happen if the offense jumps offside? It's the dog days of camp, which every team has to go through, because that's how you the build your strength of the team is to go through those tough times. And, you know, Matt Light came up to me, and he's kind of trying to butter me up, you know, and say, well, Coach, you know, if we had a night off and got a good night's rest, boy, we'd practice better and we'd have fresh legs and a lot of energy and all that. I said, well, here's what we can do. We'll put you, you know, 45 yards away from the punter and we'll punch you a ball. And if you catch it, I'll give you the night off. And if you drop it, then we do 30 extra sprints. So it's all on you. came up with it, you know, barely, but he got it. And uh, that was probably one of the happiest moments of the entire season. The 
the Patriots' first game of the regular season doubled as a coronation. The circus is in town, as Coach Belichick says. Yeah, the banner is going to be dropped. They even put these patches on our jerseys saying uh, Super Bowl 38 champion, sort of reminding us of last year, which is what we were trying to forget. As is usually the case, Colts versus Patriots provided a memorable finish. Third down and eight for the Colts at the Patriots 17. Manning out of a shotgun takes the snap. Here's the rush by Willie McGinnis. He sacks him. A dynasty delivers in key situations. And sometimes hopes the other team does not. Snap the ball down, the kick is up, the kick is on the way, and the kick is no good, no good. He misses, and the Super Bowl champs will make it 16 wins in a row. 16 wins in a row, just too short of the NFL record. Football history was on the horizon. The New England Patriots had won 16 consecutive games. Winning had become routine, as did a post-game chant created by Teddy Bruschi. It started in the training camp of the 03 season in stretch line, really. It's almost like a comedy session, really, with all the guys that are, that are sort of ripping on each other and making jokes. You know, I bet them Patriots are going to get crazy today in practice. They're going to go at each other like a tornado, made of nothing but... <laughs> But teeth and fingernails. There was laughter erupting, and then I just sort of made this sound. It was sort of a, aww, and they didn't know what I was doing, and I just went, aww, and I kept going up and up and up, and then it was like, yeah, right at the end of speech, at the end of the, end of the stretch, and everybody sort of got a kick out of it. Yeah, yeah. A post-victory tradition was born. Just one game at a time, fellas. Out of nowhere, I just came to me. I just brought everybody up, and then they sort of all knew what to do because of what I was doing in the stretch line and training camp, and it was like, how do we feel about a victory? How do we feel about a victory? Oh, yeah! And that was the beginning. In 2004, Bruski kept chanting and the Patriots kept winning. my dad talking go get the ball Ted <laughs> that's what he would always tell me you can tackle guys and you can hit guys as hard as you can but what this game is all about is that ball that they're holding you know what he said is stuck with me for a long time and it turns out the old man was right in week five NFL history arrived at Gillette Stadium the Patriots had been expecting it I think when the schedule first came out, there were a handful of us that got together and said, how many games you got to win to break the record? <laughs> that NFL record was 18 consecutive victories, and it was about to be broken. Patriots weren't just winning. They were now rewriting history on a weekly basis. Fires it long and deep. Bethel Johnson, and he's got it a five-year Touchdown, Corey Dillon. He bangs it in and puts it in the bank. 20 in a 
a row for the Patriots. Five in a row this season. It all comes down to this at Gillette Stadium. Back to throw Pennington. Pump fakes, looks, fires, end zone. And it is incomplete. Broken up intended for McCarran's. Crowd at Foxborough giving the Patriots a tremendous ovation as they make the New York Jets their 21st consecutive victim. A new National Football League record and one that could be a long time in being broken. We realized and acknowledged that we had done something that had never been done before. But, <laughs> you know, there's always that but in there that, that it didn't mean anything this year. Were we Super Bowl champions with winning that game? No, we weren't. The Patriots knew that sooner or later, the streak had to stop. The place was Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. The quarterback was rookie Ben Roethlisberger. And the result was shockingly unfamiliar. Timing pattern, left side of the end zone. played now coached in that game they just took it and and rammed it right down our throats i mean it was a total thorough demolition it was it was really a demoralizing defeat actually i think you really find out about yourself after you get your butt kicked really and we, we got our butts kicked some teams that can turn into a two three game losing streak if you don't turn it around mentally i think the attitude that we have in that locker room is we always come back that attitude was in sharp contrast to that of the Pittsburgh Steelers. I did read about some of the words that they were saying during the game about, about us never being on their level. We can't get on their level! Never, ever! Ever, 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 ever! Ever, ever! Ever, ever, ever! Ever, ever, ever! Ever, ever, ever! We can't get on their level! At that point in time, what level were they at? What had they done up to, up to that point? If they wanted to celebrate beating us one game during the regular season, go ahead and celebrate. We'll be back. The Patriots had entered the 2004 training camp with a full stable of receivers, but a shortage of defensive backs. Bill Belichick and defensive backs coach Eric Mangini found a solution. His name was Troy Brown. Number 80 was an offensive captain in his 12th NFL season. There I am sitting in front of my locker before one of the training camp practices and here comes Mangini coming in telling me uh, you got some reps on defense today and my heart starts beating fast. I was in the meeting room, actually, and I sort of just look around the room, and I look behind me. I'm like, that's Troy. <laughs> that's Troy. I look at him, I said, Troy, what are you doing here? And he says, man, I'm going to play some defensive back. I said, really? <laughs> Sometimes you get into a situation where, you know, you, you do need to do that, and I think it's a lot easier to do it now than it is, you know, the day before the game. So I go out to practice, and they throw me in for a few plays, and... I didn't look too good. I thought he had a long way to go. I thought he ought to stick to receiver, you know? But uh, I thought with a little bit of work and a little bit more coaching, it was possible. But uh, did I ever think he would, he would realistically contribute? I'd have to say no. Then came week nine in St. Louis. Defensive injuries forced Bill Belichick to make backup plans. I got that news on Friday that depending on who we take to the game, we could lose one or two guys and you'd be up. And so on Saturday when we traveled, it was down to we lose one guy, you're up. Just two plays into the game. That's exactly what happened. We got an injured Patriot player right on the sidelines there. Asante Samuel. 
And the Patriots cannot afford to be losing any cornerbacks. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. We talked about this as an emergency. Well, the emergency now is, you know, with 59 minutes left to go in the game. Introducing Troy Brown, cornerback. Of course, you know, you know, they start throwing balls left and right at me, so <laughs> it was uh, it was like wearing a big target on your jersey. They got Troy Brown out there, man. Come on. You know, I got hit in the face with a couple balls, so I could have I could have had one or two interceptions in that game. But you know, I think I held up pretty good. Three tackles on defense, three catches on offense. And one remarkable play on special teams. It'll be a 22-yard field goal attempt for Adam Vinatieri. It's a fake. Pass to the left. Touchdown, Patriots! A touchdown to Troy Brown on the fake field goal. The Patriots stun the Rams on that play, I'll tell you. Knowing the NFL rules, if you walk to the sideline, you got to come back inside the numbers and let yourself be seen by the official. And I got the referee's attention, and I just put my hand up, I'm here, you know, and uh, inside of the numbers, of course, and just trotted off to the side a little bit on the sideline, and nobody ever saw me. A surprise to the Rams, but a familiar play to Bill Belichick, thanks to a childhood spent beside his father. A football scout for the U.S. Naval Academy. The first time I saw the play was in 1962 when Navy ran it against the University of Pittsburgh. Wayne Harden was the coach, and they called it the sleeper. And so we used it my first year at the Giants several times that year on punt formation. Used it in Cleveland against uh, the Redskins for a touchdown in 91. Brian Hansen throwing this ladder all alone at the two, and he's in for a touchdown. The gadget play works. And then in 2000, used it against the Colts here my first year with the Patriots. They throw to the right, wide open. Complete to Bjornsson at the 15. A fake field goal attempt. There's pressure just on practice for this play because if Vinatieri isn't able to make that throw in practice, we know Belichick won't run it. But every time in practice, Adam had a good arm and he could get it out to Troy. And that set it up and got the thinking in the Bills' mind that, okay, this could be run during the game. The trick play worked, but it wasn't the biggest surprise of Troy Brown's season. Some things you just don't think are going to happen. I mean, Troy Brown coming in on defense, let alone Troy Brown making an interception on defense. Snap to Bledsoe. Rush comes on. He fires to the left. It's intercepted. Picked up by Troy Brown. Down inside the 25 to the 23-yard line. I mean, I've never seen anybody get so excited over an interception that our, our entire sideline did. Lo and behold, he gets two more interceptions, and he's tied for second on the team with three picks. I mean, that's how many I got. And here's a guy coming over from offense just to help us out, and he ends up get, getting just as many interceptions as I did. Gets rid of the football. Intercepted by Troy Brown. Troy Brown is third pass interception of the season. With his defensive backfield solidified, Bill Belichick could now concentrate on his opponent's lineup. We hadn't played the Ravens since I'd been here, so we really had no history with them. But the one player we did have a history on was Orlando Brown, and he was their right tackle. In all my years of coaching, I don't think we've ever had a better key than we had on Orlando Brown on his stance where we could read run or pass. When he was up in a two-point stance, it was it was 100% pass. And then when he was down, you know, he, it was always running. And, and we had it down cold. So we're getting ready to go out for the game, go out for warm-ups. And we meet with the officials and, and get the inactive list. And Orlando Brown's inactive broke our heart plan b send in teddy bruski the linebacker blitz called for me blitzing off the right side there was a running back that tried to block me and i put a put a move on him here's the rush from the other side hit it again. there was that uh, that uh, that uh, my dad talking to me again about the ball go get the ball ted
Teddy got the ball. And with 14 wins, the Patriots got another trip to the postseason. The New England Patriots entered the 2004 postseason with 14 wins and only two losses. But they would soon be facing another loss, this time on their coaching staff. Late in the season, offensive coordinator Charlie Weiss accepted the head coaching position at his alma mater, the University of Notre Dame. The athletic director called me, talked to me about their situation, talked to me about Charlie. Uh, I could tell from the way that conversation went that Charlie was, had a real good chance of the job. They interviewed him. They offered it to him. New England's defensive coordinator, Romeo Cronell, also known as Rack, was rumored for several head coaching vacancies in the NFL. Well, me being on the defensive side of the ball, shoot, if Charlie's getting a head coaching job, I know, Rome, I know Rack's going to get a head coaching job. That coaching staff, there were basically, I mean, three head coaches on that staff that we had. That's a great advantage to have as a football player when you've got great coaching like that. A great coaching staff finds motivation any way it can. In the playoffs against the Colts, Bill Belichick didn't have to look far. I got a call from somebody that said, uh, you know, coach, I don't know if you'd really be interested in knowing this or not, but the Colts have called the Steelers, and they're looking for an extra 1,500 tickets for the AFC Championship game next week when they go to Pittsburgh. When I told the team that, they didn't really say anything, but you could just kind of see the, the hair stand up on the back of their neck a little bit. If we needed any motivation at all, that gave it to us because you're basically coming into our house to, to play us in a, in, a, in a playoff game, and you think you're going to come in here and walk over us. It's not going to happen. screenplay and I sort of read that the way the the lineman action how they sort of come out that that they're, they're setting up a wall for a running back on a screenplay and I read the screenplay was able to beat one of the blockers and then put the hit on Dominic Rhodes and take the ball away. Teddy Bruschi made the tackle and Bruschi ripped it right out of his hands and the Patriots have the football. taking that ball was sort of taking the hopes and dreams of all these other teams, especially the Indianapolis Colts, and telling them, you're not going to take this from us. We're going to take it from you, just like I'm taking this ball from this running back. I think this is what they was looking for. They ain't got it. They ain't got it, baby. They ain't got it was symbolic of they don't understand. They don't understand what they have to do to be champions. They don't understand what they have to go through to be champions. And I just took it from them, and that proved to me that they ain't got it. Then in the third quarter, we had one long drive for a touchdown, and then we got the ball back at the start of the fourth quarter and had another long drive, an eight-minute drive for a touchdown. And I thought that those two drives really defined that game. It was as good of football as we've played since I've been here. going to stop the high-powered Colts. That's how. We play. That's what we do. We don't talk. We play. You come to Foxborough, it's going to be snowing. It's going to be cold. Come on in here. You want to say all you want? You want to change the rules? Change them. We still play, and we win. That's what we do. Right. Go ahead, Teddy. How we feel about a playoff victory? For the 2004 Patriots, a trip to the AFC Championship game began earlier than expected. We got to the end of the week and there was a big snowstorm. So we left early and we, after practice on Friday, we flew to Pittsburgh a day early. They weren't expecting us, you know, so you, do, you, you walk through practice Saturday, you do it in a hotel and it's not very much space. The team practiced plays in a hotel ballroom, including the first offensive play of the game, an end around to receiver Dion Branch. 
Okay, big block, one guy there. Dion, it's you and the safety for a touchdown. And Dion, I don't mind starting the game with a touchdown. field back on Halloween when Pittsburgh ended the Patriots NFL record 21 game win streak that last defeat was still on my mind like man the last time we came here we got our lunch handed to us we got our butts kicked you know we're gonna have to play great football to win this game great football was already in the game plan Deion Branch near side left Patriots first possession Brady on first and 10 at the Pittsburgh 48 to give us to Corey Dillon. Now it's an end around to Deion Branch going to the right, the 45, 40, inside the 35-yard line to about the 34. The Patriots didn't score on their first offensive play. They waited till their fifth. Time, 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 shoots it long and deep. Deion Branch, he's got it, and he's gone. Touchdown! 60-yard bomb, and he just tippy-toed into the end zone. It was now time to give rookie Ben Roethlisberger a lesson in playoff football. We tried to take away the patterns that they were running at the sticks. Um, so if it was third and five, they'd have like one receiver at five, and then have another guy at 14 or 15. And we tried to force him to throw into the second level. I remember a few plays out there where I was jumping short stuff like crazy, making him pump the ball and pull it back down and look for a second option. You know, at that point in his career, you know, most rookie quarterbacks, I mean, it's not just him, it's been all of them. They look for that first read. If it ain't there, you know, they're going to make a mistake. Burger is eyeballing his receiver all the way, and the Rodney Harrison just played it so cute. The Patriots like to get things right, no matter how long it takes. It's an end around. Coming to the other side, it's Dion Branch. Branch at the 20. He's at the 15 to the right side of the 10 to the 5 and in. Touchdown. Deion Branch put it in the bank. It's gaining interest. The Patriots are going back to the Super Bowl for the second year in a row. Oh, dream of a third Super Bowl in four years was approaching reality. Teddy Bruschi and teammate Roman Pfeiffer could not avoid it. You try to suppress success and you take it one game at a time, but come on, you're still going to think about it. You know, I still thought about it. You know, Fife still thought about it. And we sat on that plane and Fife told me, hey, Brew, you know, if we win this year, they'll call us a dynasty. A dynasty. And I looked at him. And I said, yeah, a dynasty. Twenty-four hours before Super Bowl 39, there was still time for a catch. It's a great time for your kids to be there. And, you know, they're not a part of a team, but they're pretty close to being a part of it. And so, you know, to be able to play catch with your kids and enjoy those moments, there's, there's not that many of them in that type of a setting. I was on the field and I grabbed TJ and Rex. I figured they were going to be sitting in those chairs for a long time, you know, for, for the entire game. And uh, let's get them running a little bit. Once again, Bill Belichick's father, Steve, traveled with the team. How you doing? How you doing? How you doing there? 
I remember seeing him before pregame warm-ups, and, and he was sitting out there with the commissioner and other people on the sideline that he had come in contact or knew one way or another. I saw my first football game in 1924. Just a long time ago. Yes, it is. In all those years, it's doubtful he ever heard a pregame speech quite like the one his son gave before the Patriots played the Eagles. Let me just read you a little something here. I thought this was kind of interesting. First, I thought it was, I couldn't believe it, but it's actually true. I'm talking about the Philadelphia parade after the game. All right, it's 11 o'clock in case anyone want to attend that. It's gonna go from Broad Street up to Washington Avenue, past City Hall, then down to Benjamin Franklin Parkway, and we'll end up at the Park Museum. You know, we read that to the team and, you know, just to let them know how things were going to be, you know, what, what the Eagles are going to do on Tuesday and what they had planned. Schools are going to be open, okay? And the Eagles will be in double-decker buses. And the Willow Grove Naval Air Station is going to fly over with their jets, too. That. If he wanted to get a rise out of us from the little parade route, he'd get a little rise out of us and then level us off. Level us off about still what we had to do to win. You know, basically, this is the way they're planning it. They're planning the victory parade. The game's already won. How do we win the game? How do we get that done? And it's do your job. Do your job. Do your job. Just take care of your assignment. Know what it is execute it and get it taken care of this is over six months now we've been working with this and today you've got a chance to do something very special it all comes down to your performance tonight do your job be physical and you'll be champions again tonight okay all right good luck tonight man The Patriots took the field, ready to make history. Luckily, they didn't follow their head coach. Run across the field, and I get to the other side, and, and I'm thinking, you know, there's the, the Eagles team doctors and a couple security guys. And I'm thinking to myself, what are these guys doing on our bench? And I turn around and look, and of course, there we all are standing on the other side. I went to the wrong bench. Zero slot out, 74, quick, B slam, on one, ready. Sense of direction is much easier when Tom Brady is leading your offense. Second and goal for the right of four. Brady calling Shano, back to throw. Look, 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 fires to the right, touchdown! Touchdown, right side of the end zone to David Gibbons. The play was designed to go to Fourier. You know, we practiced it on uh, on Friday, and Fourier is, was going to come up and stop at the goal line and then kind of wheel and catch the ball in the back of the end zone for a touchdown, which is the way it worked out in practice. Well, on the play, Brady comes back, and Fourier falls down. So there's his primary receiver on the ground on the goal line. And then he looks out the branch, and branch is double covered. So Tom goes outside to Gibbons, who had kind of cleared out as an outlet receiver, and, and David made a nice catch there on the sideline for the touchdown. It was a great example of Brady keeping his eyes downfield and then making a nice throw. Bill Belichick's pregame message had worked, and he wouldn't let his players forget it. Troy Brown's case. Many jobs and many plays. He lined up for 21 snaps on defense, caught two critical passes, and became the NFL's all-time leader in Super Bowl punt returns. Terrific punt. Jay 
raises Brown back to the 16 yard line near side. 40, 45, 50, 45 of Philadelphia spinning all the way to the Eagles 39. Yeah, the guys still talk about that one. You know, it's probably one of the best ones. Even though I didn't score one, it was one of the best ones they've seen. Such is the Patriot way. Troy Brown played three positions. Linebacker Mike Vrabel caught a touchdown pass. Just doing their job. When you're waiting for your third Lombardi trophy, time can't move fast enough. The clock playing a big, big part of this game now shows 526. When we took the field on that series, we told our players, you know, they're going to go two minute now. I mean, they need two scores, so we're expecting them to go at a fast pace. But the Eagles never ran their hurry up offense. Time's a wasting. Under four minutes left. I think they're being a little too casual with the time and a little too cavalier. I remember on the sideline saying, we're ahead by 10 points, right? I mean, do I have the score right? Because, I, don't, I mean, you know, sometimes you just draw a blank. I'm expecting to break the huddle, and I'm expecting the Eagles to be right behind me. But they're still in the huddle. The seconds are ticking away. I look to the guys and say, I don't know what they're doing, but uh, this is the defense we're running, and when they come and line up, let's play it well. I wasn't going to say, hey, Donovan, you might want to hurry this up, you know? <laughs> you know, nobody never really figured it out. And then you hear all the rumors coming out uh, after the game, you know, that Donovan was dry heaving or whatever it was in the huddle and throwing up. Then you figured out, you know, that, that, that was the problem. The Eagles were slow, but also successful. Back goes McNabb. He fires for the end zone. Leaping reception for a touchdown. And there's life. And there's life. Could the Patriots become a dynasty? The question had lingered throughout the entire 2004 season. Here was the answer. 17 seconds away from back-to-back -back world championships for the Patriots. You know, hug Charlie and Romeo there at the end. We kind of knew we'd never be together again, and, and what a great way to end it. Super Bowl 36 and Super Bowl 38 were last second field goals. So I said, this time, I'm getting Bill. <laughs> I'm going to get him. After I did it, he didn't see me at first, so I grabbed him by the coat, I turned him around, gave him a big hug. The 2004 Patriots played for moments like these. Celebrating three Super Bowl titles in four years. But moments, even great ones, don't last forever. First month and a half of 2005 was pretty good for me. We won the AFC Championship in Pittsburgh. We win the Super Bowl in Jacksonville. I go to my first Pro Bowl. <laughs> uh, a day and a half after I'm home after the Pro Bowl, I'm in an ambulance going to Mass General. I've suffered a stroke overnight. The Boston Globe now reports that he apparently suffered a broken blood vessel in his head. Teddy Buski is spending his second night here at Mass General, and hospital officials are hoping it's his last. He could be released as early as tomorrow, and that's good news for his legion of fans. I think that that taught me a lot about how it all can be taken away from you very quickly. All of us are faced with adversity in our lives. I mean, it, can, it comes in a lot of different forms. Look, on a personal note, on a personal note, I coached this game today with a heavy heart. My dad passed away last night, and uh, so I'm going to have to attend to some, some things personally.
I'd like to dedicate this ball, give it to Bill in honor of the memory of his dad. All Thank right. You. You know, it's my breakdown after every time we win a football game, you know. I ask, I ask the question and how we're feeling. We get a little cheer going, and Bill sort of pushes me aside after that game. I'm going to break us from down. Let's go, everybody up. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. And I want to know how we feel about having Teddy Bruschi back. <laughs> Their season started with a historic winning streak. It ended with a third Super Bowl title. And it showed that dynasties still exist. The Patriots are proof. Back to back, three out of four. Yes, it's a dynasty. You can be a Super Bowl champion that, that wins an individual Super Bowl, or you can be one of those teams that are always associated with being the best, you know? And with being the best, they use the word dynasty. They use it for the Steelers, they use it for the Cowboys, and the Niners, and the Packers, and they use it with us, and it makes us proud. We were one of the best teams ever, if not the best, and I'd put us up against anyone. And I know that's impossible to do, you know, because teams have come and gone. But if you ask me, the best team ever to play in this league has been the New England Patriots.